Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The challenge of juvenile justice tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, President and Executive Editor of The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Tammy Sawyer, Shelby County Commissioner. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Along with Josh Spickler, Executive Director of Just City, which advocates for uh, justice reform. Thanks for being here again. Thanks, Eric. And Bill Drees is a reporter with The Daily Memphian. I will start with you, uh, Commissioner Sawyer. You are, the, the commission is, there's a whole lot going on with juvenile justice right now, and we'll kind of try to pick our way through that, and maybe talk about justice reform overall because, you know, the, the issues intersect. But most immediately, there's a vote after the new year, I think we said it was January 9th, on, uh, that the commission's going to take on $130 million for a new juvenile detention center that would go up next to the existing juvenile court that would be phase one. Phase two would be renovations to the existing one. Is this the time to be building a new juvenile justice center when simultaneously uh, the oversight of the juvenile uh, justice center has, by the federal government has ended, it was six years, and the first of I think two reports has come out that was pretty scathing in terms of, of the way uh, uh, juveniles are handled in the existing justice center. So. Is this the time to be building a new justice center? Does this fix the problem or do we have multiple problems and challenges that need to be tackled? So Eric, I think that it is a both and situation. We wouldn't be able to break ground on a new center for at least 18 months whenever the vote passes. Um, my biggest concern though is the optics. Giving $130 million to uh, juvenile court without addressing the reports that have come out, without putting in place um, a continuation of oversight now that um, it has been removed by DOJ really shows a lack of attention to what that report is saying. And that report, as you mentioned, is very harsh. And there's some things that we as commissioners and the mayor have to do, have to address. Um, and I think that before we rush to build a new center, we know that the center needs um, repairs. We know that the kids are in ad inadequate housing, have in ad inadequate um, rooms for education. Um, and so they do need a new center, but I think we need to really address the um, oversight issues and the concerns that came out of that last report. And I should say, before I go to you, uh, Josh, we have invited uh, Judge Dan Michael, who oversees the, the, the Shelby County Juvenile Justice Center, to be on the show. We haven't committed to a date, but we hope to get him on after the new year, and he's been on in the past. I, I, I won't speak for the judge, but I'm sure he disagrees with a whole lot of things that will be said today, and I'll sort of repeat that out of fairness to to the other side, but Josh, your take on the the report findings that were that, that came out, and would you help me out. Who was who did this report, and then your take on their findings? Well, the most recent report was uh, issued by the Due Process Monitor, and and so the, there were several monitors. There were three monitors appointed uh, during that oversight that the Department of Justice had over our juvenile court, and the most recent one uh, was by the Due Process Monitor. Her name is Sandra Simpkins. Uh, and this report was based on her findings uh, in October, so just a couple of months ago. Uh, and this was requested by the Shelby County Commission. Uh, these reports uh, uh, are ours. They belong to the people of this community. And she issued that report uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And it was a very scathing report that uh, very, with a lot of detail, uh, described a juvenile court that uh, operates with a culture of intimidation, and those were her words, uh, and in particular uh, regarding how kids are represented and who represents them and who controls who represents them, uh, and, and, and it details a lot of things that happen in that five, six year oversight that did not, did not result in the change that this community deserves. And so uh, Commissioner Sawyer's right in that it, proceeding toward something as large as this juvenile detention facility without going back and addressing uh, un uh, addressed issues in that court is really an affront to the, this community, our children. Uh, we can't break ground or even start talking about this unless we go back and deal with some of that. Uh, Bill Drees. Uh, Commissioner, where does the, the Juvenile Assessment Center fit into the equation and, and, and how does it mesh or not mesh with the Juvenile Detention Center? Because at the outset, the Assessment Center uh, appeared to be something much different than what it's turned into. 
So the assessment center has definitely evolved. Um, if you remember when it was first um, broached on the county commission before I was elected, there was community outcry, um, concerns about what the assessment center would be used for. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of community involvement. Josh, uh, Demetria, Frank, others have uh, given a lot of their time and energy to shaping what a JAC can really look like um, and how it can not be as harmful as just a center where children are diverted to um, but really where children and families are assisted and are helped. Um, what we were able to do with the Juvenile Assessment Center is put in some of that same oversight that I'm talking about for the juvenile court and facility. Um, so we now have an advisory board. People can apply to be on the advisory board um, before the end of January. Uh, we've appointed um, attorney and law professor Demetria Frank uh, to be on uh, the advisory board for juvenile court and for the assessment center. Um, and so I think that those measures definitely have to be in place. And, and as a county, as a city, we have to start thinking about what do we need to do um, to earn the community's trust in such a time where people are seeing so many um, glaring inequities happen before we pull the trigger on things like $130 million for a brand new building to house children as um, inmates. And I think the largest concern in the community um, is that these are pre-trial, you know, these children have not yet been convicted. Um, I've heard words like hardened criminals and, you know, things like that addressed to these youth. Um, and they're awaiting trial. Um, and just like anyone else, they deserve um, a fair trial. Um, they deserve as kids even more amenities than we're currently providing. Um, and they deserve not to be shipped off to adult prison. So there is uh, some oversight of the Juvenile Assessment Center, which would operate through the University of Tennessee right. Health, Health Science Center. Even though the memorandum of, of agreement over juvenile court itself has, has ended, is, is gone, are there plans for oversight of it? We are discussing plans for oversight. There have not been any laid out yet. Um, that's why I asked for the delay so that we could really sit down and address that. On January 9th, when uh, the commission reconvenes into our first committees, uh, on the agenda, we will be having a discussion about the funding of the building as well as what oversight looks like for 2019 and beyond. All right. Uh, Josh, what, 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 what do you think oversight should look like for a juvenile court? Should it resemble what was in place with a memorandum? But, well, I mean, we had the Department of Justice here, the United States Department of Justice and mm -hmm. all that that entails here for five, six years. Uh, and, and we still, again, in this report, uh, have detailed descriptions of how this court was able to avoid accountability. This court was able to uh, eventually end that oversight without addressing all of the needs. Uh, so you've got to have something with teeth and, and you know, the commissioner sitting next to me and, and they fund a juvenile court and uh, and there's a lot of money uh, being uh, sent toward the direction of children and, and their detention and their, and their treatment in courts and uh, and so something with teeth that perhaps involves uh, oversight of that budget oversight of the dollars that are spent to do this uh, is to me the only thing uh, that makes makes some sense because we, we've got to get this uh, under control for people listening who someone out there one or, or many um, are when we talk about children and we talk about, you know, you mentioned hardened cr criminals, other people are thinking of maybe um, crimes in their mind that they've seen that teenagers have done or that they, and they've seen security camera footage or they've seen something, you know, or they, these, these um, children have been convicted of violent crimes. What do you say to them? What is the answer there where um, there is someone who's been convicted and is 16, is 15, and has killed or done some kind of very violent crime I don't think you're advocating that those people shouldn't be put in some place, no. but I don't know. No, of course not. And, and violent crime uh, is a problem in, in many communities, including this one, and violent crime can be um, committed by, by children. And that's unfortunate and sad, and, and when it happens, we should focus every resource possible on that child, that family, that victim, that victim's family, in making sure that both sides are restored to the greatest extent possible uh, in the eyes of this community. And that does not mean for a 16-year-old isolation. It does not mean adult prison. It means finding out why this happened, certainly holding a child accountable. 16, 17, however old the child is, it, it must be held accountable. But the very, very 
top of our list should be making sure this never happens again with that child or any child. What was missing? How did this child get to the point where it was, he or she was, was able to commit a crime like that? And that's what's missing, I think. We, we, we talk about resources, but the budget for this resource center is, is minuscule. Uh, if you go to any school in this uh, community, the teachers, the administrators will tell you that mental health care for children is a huge gap in this community. We've got to start funding that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we had the superintendent of, I believe it was Arlington Schools, is that right, Bill, who talked about mm -hmm. the number of, of interventions and incidents they have where they need some level, not, not violent crime level, but some level of mental health intervention. It was striking. It was a 1,000 a year or something like that. And uh, we can go back and figure that out. But, but it really was striking. It is not just an issue within, you know, people want to say the old city schools or an urban problem. It, when we had all the superintendents on, they all talked about those needs across all types of schools. But back to the issue for, for you, Commissioner uh, Sawyer, for the people who listen and say, I, I want accountability. I saw the videotape. I mean, most recently, you know, the, very prom the killing of the very prominent um, uh, uh, head of the chamber, Phil Trinari. There's videotape of, of what turned out to be teenagers in, in some fashion. Like, no, nothing's been, uh, hasn't gone through their process yet, but, but it looked, these teenagers somehow involved, it looked like. But there have been other ones that have been convicted. What do you say? What is, what is the right accountability? What is the right punishment for teenagers who've committed violent crime? Yeah, so I'll say first, you know, there's been a lot of talk about when we talk about um, criminal justice reform that we're not thinking about the victims. I mean, that's not true at all. I've been a victim of crime. I've been robbed. I've had my car stolen. I think we all can talk about, you know, different crimes. And, and luckily, I've never had a family member taken from me or been a victim of a uh, violent physical crime myself. But the first step is that our hearts and go out to victims and, and we want justice for families as well. But what we're saying is that children in Memphis and in Shelby County are currently so underserved that we have to get to the root of what's happening. What gets a 15 year old to the point where they enact a carjacking? where they get to a point where they drive to an ATM or, you know, and say like, I want all your money, or, you know, they, they shoot a stepfather. Uh, there's a story there. There's something that, that they did not receive in their life, whether it was um, education or resources or any type of accountability. And I think, you know, if we, if we talk about what's missing in our community, if we talk about the lack of funding for education, if we talk about the lack of funding um, for trauma-informed counselors in schools, if we talk about the lack of mental health care funding, um, we could get to a better answer, a better system of accountability, and not just accountability, but rehabilitation. We're not rehabilitating kids by isolating isolating them in adult prisons, you know, and, and, and I think that's the biggest point there is you take a 15 year old, you put them in adult prison, what happens when they get out at 25, right? They didn't get rehabilitated, you know, um, and, and the resources that they come out with needing at 25 are even less available to them than they were when they were 15 and considered youth. Two, uh, 12 minutes left here. Um, Bill. So. What is the answer then for for a teenager who is accused of murder, who who is accused of the most the most violent offenses? Because it, in my discussions with with some criminal justice system leaders, they say that the goal here also includes protecting society from children who have who have a serious problem. I mean. Just really quickly, Bill, we're not saying drop them back off on the mm -hmm. street, right, uh, and put another gun in their hand. But if you look at the case that's sweeping the country right now, Santoya Brown, right here in Tennessee, who just received 51 years from the Supreme Court uh, without any understanding of the fact that she was a victim of the illegal sex trafficking you know, trade. And there's no addressing the situation that led to her being in that hotel room at 16 with a 40-year-old plus man. Right. And so she was a victim and he was a victim. And so how do we address something like that? She wasn't just a murderer. She didn't just, you know, um, make a bad decision. This was a girl um, who had been forced into prostitution since a very young age and, and had and had not had any resources. No one had intervened on her behalf, right? So we're not saying that um, you drop a kid back off and say, have a great life, but you wrap around them. You hear the word wrap around all the time. You wrap around them. You provide the resources that are need to say, your life can be better. You can be a different person. You might have to serve some time, but when you come out, how do you become a whole productive citizen and know that there are people here to help you? 
And it's, mm. it's very tempting to, to say that if you act like an adult, we're going to treat you like an adult. And I think uh, a, a really good example of, of um, how we're doing that is to compare us to cities that are different in some ways, but, but not so different in many others. And, and every community suffers from violent crime, and children commit violent crime in every community. And in this state, last year, uh, this court, uh, this community, transferred 92 children to be treated as adults for crimes, some of them violent. Down the road in Nashville, they transferred four. Four children in all of 2017, and they have violent crime in Nashville, and children commit violent crime. What they have there is they've stopped the slide down the continuum of treating children like adults. We don't do it in schools uh, until we absolutely have to, and we shouldn't do it in the criminal justice system. The problem is what these children need and what we can give them are two different things. We can give them a criminal justice system. It's big, it's robust, we have a lot of uh, resources behind it. And that's what we begin to give children earlier and earlier and earlier in this community. We've got to stop that. We've got to say, that's not what they need. They don't need a cage. They don't need isolation because their brains are still developing. They need accountability, but there's a way to give kids accountability that looks much different from giving a 44-year-old man accountability. Well, and, and one of the things that I've heard, I, I think, since since I started doing this for a living is that the juvenile justice system is supposed to be different from the adult system and that and that the lines are not as clear in all cases as they are in the adult system because the goal is is to acknowledge that you're dealing with someone different when you are dealing with with a juvenile. Uh, do you think that's the reality of the juvenile justice system anymore? <laughs> I don't. I think that that's written into the code. That's written into the law. You're exactly right. The law understands that children are different. There's a lot more gray area. There should be a lot more options for dealing with children who commit crimes that are violent and dangerous. Uh, but I think the reality is, is illustrated by those two numbers I just told. In 92 instances in this community, we transferred children to be treated fully as adults, including where they're detained. In Nashville, they did it four times. Uh, and, and making that shift and making that change just takes bold leadership. It takes a community to get behind that bold leadership to say, enough is enough. Adult criminal justice is not how we're going to stop this problem, if it is a problem, of crime being committed by teenagers. It, it, another example, we'll come back to this, and we're, we're throwing a lot of different programs around, but the, the Youth Assessment Center, um, which will be as a pilot program, I think about $500,000 going to the uh, UT uh, Health Science Center to over, over three years um, to deal with less violent offenders so that they, I guess the theory is that they don't go into the Juvenile Justice Center, they can go somewhere and get some kind of treatment and counseling and so on. And Floyd Bonner, who's the sheriff, said that in Miami, an, an assessment center there reduced juvenile arrest 67% in a 14-year time frame. Is that the kind of stuff for you that's going in the right direction? It is going in the right direction. Again, the oversight that has been put in place is needed. There's a couple of things about who owns the data that comes to this. Are we studying children or are we aiding children? You know, there's a lot of concerns about that. But I think that this is in the right direction because the list of um, of transgressions that would place a child at the juvenile assessment center versus sending them down uh, to juvenile court really uh, keeps a lot of kids from having the experience of even being locked up, in, which can really change the trajectory of their life. You don't realize that in a moment, a kid's whole identity can change just from being handcuffed, um, and, and let alone being taken up the elevator into juvenile lockup. And so I think one of the um, things to look at here is how is this going to work across different bodies? So MPD and the Sheriff's Department are going to have to, and you, and you mentioned how Sheriff Bonner um, you know, is a, a supporter of the assessment center, but MPD officers, sheriff's officers, they are going to have to uh, buy into this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and because the arrests come from, uh, the decision is made on the street by the police officer, so that's going to be important as well for it to succeed. Can, can I make a point about the Dade County facility that often gets mentioned in this conversation? And that's and I, Miami, the one in, that we in I Miami, right, the one you just mentioned, and it, and it gets referenced a lot by leadership in this community. And I'd like to point out that this uh, facility in, in Miami-Dade County is funded uh, to the tune of millions of dollars a year, and it was funded after the community voted <laughs> to raise their own taxes to do so. So that's a very important and I think critical distinction between what we've done here so far and what Miami-Dade County did. It, it, with six minutes left here, we've, we've mentioned a lot of different entities. And I, I went through, um, you know, we've been MPD in the city, a county commission, obviously, juvenile court. I went through just, and I made a list of everybody has some, every, you know, 
governmental body that has some say over justice. And it's, it's kind of insane. I mean, because you go Congress and the president, U.S. attorney, which there's a local U.S. attorney. You've got local federal judges. You've got the state setting laws, <clears throat> excuse me, that the county has to <clears throat> act upon. I'm losing my voice. In the county, you've got the sheriff, you've got the DA, you've got the public defender's office, the county commission, county mayor, and then you've got the city with MPD, the council, city mayor, and then you've got suburban police districts that can yes. have their own sort of rules about how they handle people. Mm -hmm. What, as a county commissioner, given all those different competing forces and elected officials and appointed officials, what does the county commission have authority over in this question of juvenile justice? Obviously the funding of this new facility or not, the youth assessment center pilot program or not, but of the court and how the court acts within its within the walls of the Juvenile Justice Center. And let me also say, I, I should have, we've invited Judge Dan Michael to be on the show. He couldn't be here today. We hope to get him on in a future show. But that question of all those intersecting and, and what, what authority do you actually have as the county commission? So the major one, as you mentioned, is we're the fiduciary agent. We have the funding power, um, which, for example, we delayed the $130 million so that we can discuss oversight before building, you know, awarding uh, a new building. Um, secondly, we have the power to enact oversight. DOJ pulls out the Shelby County commissioners and the mayor can say, this is the oversight with which we want to make sure that juvenile court um, is still continuing in the spirit of, you know, the the former memorandum of um, the MOA. And so while we can't go in and say, Judge Dan Michaels, this is how you're going to operate day to day. I want you to walk the halls from, you know, every 15 minutes. What we can do um, is build our own oversight plan and act that. Um, and again, the way that we operate with the funding, when we give it, how we give it, and uh, what it goes to is also going to be important. Can I say, I've, I've been called a naysayer on this issue, but I, I could point out things that have happened uh, this year around criminal justice, which is a massive, massive complex system, and it does involve many actors. But I can point out that uh, bold leadership brought us a conversation during the election, and Commissioner Sawyer was a part of that conversation, Mayor Harris was a part of the conversation about charging money to make phone calls from our facilities. And uh, through their leadership, and because of their leadership, we made calls free for kids to call home. And I was down there just this week visiting uh, one of those kids, and she told me about being able to talk to her mom every day. And not just her mom, but one of her friends, every day. And so I'm hearing a child talk to me now, like more like a child who is in her community, is living in her parents' house. And that kind of bold leadership that we saw, just on that one small issue, changed that girl's life, and girls after her, and boys after her. So. Bold leadership is one of the keys yeah. to bringing all of those pieces together on criminal justice reform. Just three minutes, we'll go back to Bill. Is there any hope that what happens with the assessment center might at some point be applied to children who are in there for the most serious offenses? I mean, I think that's, a, <laughs> that's not the intent at this point, right? But I think, again, we have a, a continuum that we go down and, and where, you know, what we give children based on the severity of their crime. And ultimately where I hope we get to is that we see every child and every human being in this county who commits even the most heinous of, heinous of acts as redeemable at some point in their life. Because what we know about crime and criminal behavior is that you age out of it eventually and you become practically incapable of committing crimes. Mm -hmm. and, and how we bring you back into the community is a big conversation as well. Uh, but yes, I think ultimately we have to give children who are involved in really dangerous and violent crimes, a lot of those same opportunities. It's the only way we're going to bring them back into the community in a healthy, productive way. And we also have to look at the value of the children's lives. I mean, you look at the um, fraternity president at Baylor who was committed on several, several um, crimes of sexual offense and the result was he has a lot of promise and he could get better and you know I think his you know sentence was negligible and we've seen that happen around uh, the country with affluent children affluent youth um, and I think when we look at when kids in Shelby County commit crime to your point Eric they see the black and white grainy picture on the news and they are like those kids are just bad they're all you know horrible and we don't believe that there's value to their life. Lock them up, throw away the key. They're not rehabilitatable. That's not a word, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so the biggest point is we have to also understand the children in Shelby County and the children in Memphis especially, their lives have the same value as a fraternity president in Baylor. But, and, and 
ironically, if that's the right word, you're saying that that for training president, from your point of view, wasn't punished enough. So there's some that it is not. That, that I'm saying a, there's not a balance. There's not a balance. Right. It, just a minute left. We could do a whole show on this. The, <laughs> the federal government passed pretty sweeping criminal justice reform. Surprised a lot of people in some ways that you've got you know President Trump, Republican who Republicans who mm -hmm. have more and more often than not run on law and order kind of issues. With just a minute, maybe I'll get your take, Josh, first. And does that have an impact down to? That's just federal laws. Right. Does it's, it have an impact in Memphis? To call it sweeping is is maybe not accurate. It, it's a, the media it's likes going that to, word. They do. <laughs> it's very small. Um, move in, in the right direction. It's, it's uh, making things retroactive that have been true for quite some time. It, it does only involve federal uh, cases, federal prisons, which is a small percentage. Most of the people incarcerated in this country are, are, done so, are incarcerated by state and local facilities, state and local governments. So if there are too many people in our jails and prisons, this will impact maybe 2,000 people. Other things happening with it that are good, but it's very small. I would Quickly. just say the same thing that look at this and, and the whole picture. This is a good first step. It's a baby step. Okay. <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, Bill. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.